Okay. You can go. Okay. Uh, my name is Callie Capel. I'm a graduate student in the DOS lab. And today I'm going to be talking to you about some work I've done on predicting RNA protein binding affinities and some initial progress towards optimizing and validating a general score function for RNA protein interactions. So as a turn of players and in our lab, I know that we're all very excited about RNA, but in our cells, RNA does not exist in isolation. In fact, a lot of what it does is interact with proteins. And RNA binding proteins are really important. They affect RNA localization, translation, degradation, editing, stability, and alternative splicing. I'm showing here two example pictures of proteins interacting with RNAs. And in addition, m many of the cell's most important machines are RNPs, meaning that they're composed of both RNA and proteins. So the ribosome, which translates mRNA into proteins, the spliceosome, which uh, processes mRNA, pre-mRNA transcripts, and telomerase, which extends the ends of chromosomes. Um, so the goal would really to be to develop a predictive model for how RNA interacts with proteins. So we already have really a really great model, the nearest neighbor rules, which predict RNA secondary structure. So starting from some primary sequence, we can predict that the RNA is going to fold up into some given secondary structure. And these predictions are very powerful. We also have within Rosetta, which is a software suite developed in our lab, um, RNA score functions that discriminate between different 3D conformations of RNA. So here I'm showing two different conformations RNA molecule. Here, this one, we can discriminate that this one's lower in energy than this one. As well, we can start from some sequence and make a prediction for what its 3D uh, conformation is going to look like. And here I'm showing a prediction for um, some RNA, and this is the crystal structure in white versus our prediction in blue. So we're reasonably good at doing this. And then addition, in addition, although we don't develop this in our lab, there are similar protein score functions within Rosetta that discriminate between 3D protein conformations. So we're also able to make predictions for how proteins look like in three dimensions. So the question that we really want to ask is, can we predict how RNA will bind to protein? So these score functions work individually for RNA and for proteins, but when we put them together, they we don't necessarily know that they'll work. And the question that I'm really focusing on in this talk is whether we can predict how tightly different RNA sequences will bind to a protein, and from this basically gain specificity information about uh, a given protein. So I'll give a brief overview of the project that I'll be talking today, talking about today. So what we're going to do in this project is basically we're always going to start with a crystal structure of an RNA protein complex. So we already know how some RNA binds to a protein, and we know how it looks like in three dimensions. Then computationally, we want to be able to make mutations to the RNA sequence and predict how this new mutant structure is going to look like in three dimensions. And then from this new structure, we want to be able to predict the binding affinity. And then we want to repeat this for many different RNA mutants. And in doing so, we would like to have a, a large experimental set of binding affinities so we can compare our, our, our predictions to experiment and see how well we're doing. And then if we iterate in this comparison, we would like to be able to basically optimize our binding affinity calculation. So we can write out theoretically what would be the absolute correct binding affinity calculation to make. But we're in, practical, in practice, we're actually going to need to make a lot of approximations. And we don't know which are sort of the, the best approximations to make. And so we want to iterate and sort of optimize this calculation. In addition, we want to optimize a score function. And so the score function is just what, what sort of interactions do we want to count between the RNA and the protein? How do we want to score how well RNA is interacting with the protein? And so we want to be able to optimize this as well. So we're going to iterate over this, uh, over this process many times. And eventually, we'll end up to use this optimized method of binding affinities. Um, just as we would with, uh, for example, nearest neighbor rules or the Rosetta other score functions that we have. So the model system that I'm using in this project is the MS2 coat protein, which many of you are probably familiar with. This is a really great system, a re really great model system for this project for a few reasons that I'll discuss in more detail. Um, but first, MS2 is a bacteriophage that infects E. coli. And the MS2 capsid is made up of about of 180 copies of the 
MS2 coat protein. Each dimer interacts with one RNA hairpin. And um, so we have this really beautiful data set from the Greenleaf lab, um, which uses this technology that they've developed where they have basically repurposed a sequencing chip to display hundreds of thousands of variants of RNA sequences and then by flowing on labeled, fluorescently labeled protein and imaging the chip, they can get out really uh, kinetic data and binding affinities for all of those different RNA sequences. And so they did this for the um, MS2 coat protein with over 100,000 different RNA variants. And so we have this data set in hand. And then if you remember the other requirement that I said that we need for this project is to have a crystal structure that we start from. And so with MS2, there are a lot of crystal structures available. And here I'm showing a crystal structure of the RNA, bound, the wild type RNA bound to the protein. Um, so there's sort of, there are a lot of challenges with structure prediction, but there are sort of three main ways that you can mess up your predictions. The first would be um, an inaccurate method of binding affinity calculation. Um, and well, this from the start, because this is sort of something in the project that we're trying to um, develop and we're trying to come up with a better method for. The second thing would be the accuracy of the score function. And again, this is something that we're trying to uh, iterate over and improve. But then the third thing would be the accuracy of your structure prediction. So if you don't have structures for all your different mutants, then you have a potential problem that if you predict the structure totally incorrectly, then even if your binding affinity calculation method was perfect and your score function was per perfect, you would still predict poor binding affinities. Um, and so the good thing about the MS2 system is that we, we don't think this is a huge problem. So there are several structures of MS2 coat protein RNA hairpin complexes. Here I'm showing pictures of the wild type and then several different mutant structures. And the, the thing I just really want you to see here is that they all look very similar. So all these crystal structures, all the mutants basically bind to the protein in very similar ways. And so we think that with relatively little manipulation of our mutant structures, we'll be able to predict something that's close enough to the mutant structure. And here, everything's overlaid. It's kind of hard to see. But the point is that the MS2 complexes with mutant RNAs are very similar. And so we think that we will be able to predict these and this will not be the limiting factor in our binding affinity predictions. So I also wanna walk you through some general features of MS2 binding. So here on the left, I'm showing the hairpin sequence. Um, and so one important thing is of course, to maintain this hairpin formation. So this tertiary conformation of the RNA to the protein. But this is not the only important thing. So in addition, we there needs to be a purine at position minus 10. So this purine at minus 10 is bulged out and interacting with the protein. Um, we also need a pyrimidine at the minus is stacking on top of a tyrosine in the protein. And um, we need adenines at both positions minus seven and minus four. So that's also very important. Those are also interacting with the protein. So now I'll, I'll start going into walking you through how we're gonna make our binding affinity predictions. So the thing that we really wanna calculate is the difference in energy between the state on the left. So where we have folded RNA by itself, the folded protein by itself, and what is the difference between the energy of that state versus the energy when the folded RNA is bound to the protein? Um, and so in order to calculate this, we're basically gonna look at a reference state um, for each of these. So this folded RNA is in equilibrium with its unfolded, with the unfolded RNA. And then the folded protein is also in equilibrium with the unfolded protein. The bound complex in addition is in equilibrium. So, the binding affinity calculation that we're going to be making, this delta G bind, which is what we're trying to predict, is going to be equal to this delta G complex. So the energy of this state with reference to the unfolded state minus this folding energy, which would just be minus the delta G folding of the RNA minus delta G folding of the protein. Um, so when we're trying to make these binding affinity calculations, we're going to be trying to figure out how do we estimate each one of these three components of the binding affinity. So the first thing that we want to do is figure out how to calculate that delta G complex. And so I'm going to be showing a lot of scatter plots in, in these next slides. 
um, these are for these are calculations made for sequences that are not predicted to, to change their secondary structure. So this is not all 100,000 mutants of the RNA. This is just a small subset that we're starting with. And on the x-axis, I'm going to be plotting experimental delta delta G and k-calper mole, so relative to the wild type sequence, and then the predicted complex energy on the y-axis. And Rosetta units, again, relative to the wild type structure. So um, I tried several different methods of calculating this complex energy, and I'm going to be showing some of them here. I also want to note before I go through these that we wouldn't expect actually a perfect correlation with um, our complex energy versus the experimental binding affinity, even if our predictions of the complex energy were perfect, because we're forgetting, of course, the delta G RNA and the delta G protein. So we're really just looking for things that look better relative to other plots here. Um, so here I'm showing two different methods of relaxing the wild type structure. And so what I mean by relaxing is that we, we need to make so we're scoring a PDB, which we've taken right from the protein data bank, um, with the Rosetta score function. And we basically need to get rid of like very small changes that would drastically reduce the energy. So if we don't do this initially, then when we make a mutation and then we minimize the structure, all of a sudden we fix some super small torsion and we get a huge drop in energy, even though this mutation should have actually made the energy of the structure much worse. So here I'm just showing two different methods of relaxing the wild type structure, and one of them seems to work better than the other. And so for the remaining plots, I'll be using this method of relaxing the, the crystal structure. Um, so after we're making mutations to the wild type crystal structure, we have to do something to it. To, we can't just like put a new residue in there and then just leave it and call this our new structure. And so. One thing that we can try is minimizing that structure and using restraints when we're minimizing it to keep the positions close to the positions in the crystal structure. So we tried this. This looks a little bit better than what we were trying originally. Um, we can also try this and keep a cutoff of 20 angstrom, so only minimize and then repack. So I'll explain repacking is basically we're wiggling the side chains of everything around to try to optimize their uh, interaction. And so we would only do this within 20 angstroms of the mutation. Here, we keep the backbone fixed, so we don't allow backbone atoms to move. And this sort of looks the best so far. Here, we uh, fix the backbone and keep only move things within 20 angstroms of the mutation. Here, we only minimize, so we skip that repacking step. Here, we do minimization and only do it within 20 angstroms of the mutation. And here, we do minimization only within a cutoff of 20 angstroms of the mutation. And this. I was wondering, how do you say whether one of those graphs is better or worse, the, the R squared? I'm just the using thing. the R, yeah, just the R value. Yeah, there are, of course, other methods that you could use to determine. You might want to point out, um, maybe you did earlier, that we have a philosophy where we will do anything we can to get a reasonable, to find a reasonable fit to these data, and then, uh, to really rigorously test your approach, you're going to be making blind, blind predictions for other complexes. Right. And we'll be bugging the Green Leaf Lab for, uh, to test those. Right. right. So right. So we feel free to do what we want with these right. selfish data. Right, exactly. So this, making, this is just any claim the, of rigor. You know. No, no, no. This is just sort of the optimization step. And to, to prove that our method actually works, we'll need to make blind predictions. So looking at these plots, the one that sort of looks the best is if we keep um, the backbone fixed. And so for the remaining slides, we'll uh, calculate keeping the backbone fixed and doing minimization and repacking. So the line on the right side is presumably things that are like unmeasurable. Yeah, exactly. Like keeping all of those. So in the R values that I'm calculating, I'm not including oh, any okay, of those okay. points. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Um, plotting them because it is still useful to know if we're making predictions where like those things should shouldn't actually be binding if we're making predictions saying they do bind then RNA score function I mentioned and a protein score function that already work pretty well and so we don't really want to mess with these a whole lot um, but the problem is that out of the box, they're not really compatible with each other. So they have several terms within them, 
that actually are the same. So they're measuring the same sort of interactions. So we measure, for example, hydrogen bond interactions in RNA and in proteins. But we weight those interactions differently relative to the other terms in the RNA score functions versus the protein score functions. So I basically tried to rescale the two score functions relative to each other in, in 10 different ways. Um, by trying to make the minimal perturbations to the score function possible. And so here, some of these look really terrible and some of them look sort of reasonable. And really all I wanna say is that this, this one looks the best and it also, um, there's a relatively minor rescaling factor that has happened here. So I don't think either of the RNA or the protein score functions has changed very dramatically in the score function. And we get something that looks sort of reasonable in our value of 0.53. Which one? Which one was preserved, or which? Uh, which what was the base base score function for this one? Protein one or the RNA one? So the protein one is preserved entirely, okay. and um, basically the hydrogen bond, the weight for the hydrogen bonds for the side chains was slightly increased relative to all the other RNA terms. Got it. Make the protein goals here. Yeah, it's sociological, which is yeah. to come up with a unified score function that everyone will use in Rosetta, mm -hmm. uh, so that they they're doing their work on proteins and suddenly come up with a protein RNA complex. They're not going to freak out uh, because that changed their score function. Right. So it's kind of yeah, it's kind of sociological. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah good yeah. if the protein stuff stays it's good. It, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. um portion of the binding affinity calculation that we want to focus on is how to estimate this delta G RNA. And um, so this, this could be quite a challenge because RNA is a very flexible molecule. And to really rigorously compute its free energy, you would actually need to be able to calculate from a structural perspective, you would need to predict its full density of states. Um, and this is not something that we really have the computation to be able to do for, for many different mutants. So um, here I'm showing basically the most simple method that you could possibly use to calculate this uh, delta G RNA, which is actually just the exact same thing that I showed before. So we could assume that for all RNA mutants, having free energy, which is a pretty bad assumption, but it, it is one that we could make. And so this is sort of our baseline comparison. The other thing that we could do is basically take the complex structure and then just by itself score the RNA and by itself score the protein and call that delta G RNA and delta G protein. And this looks really terrible. So even though this R value seems like it got better, it's basically, it's really driven by these outliers up here. We've pretty much gotten rid of all the correlation. And this sort of makes sense because um, the, the complex, the confirmation of the RNA in the complex is not really representative of what its confirmation would be in solution. And so it's probably not a very good estimate of its free energy unfolding. Um, the other thing that we could try is actually just using um, a fragment assembly approach to fold all of the RNA um, sequences. And so I tried this and this actually, this looks better than either of these plots. We still sort of maintain a correlation. We have a lot of outliers over here, but this seems to get a little bit better. Oh, the side. Yeah, I was saying these seem okay. All right. Yeah. I'm not actually sure what those outliers are. How many, just, how many points are there on the right-hand side? Are there like hundreds? Or over here? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's more than 100. Okay. I yeah. just wonder if some of the ones that are outliers there could be experimental problems, like for some reason those RNAs. Um, there was a cluster in the experiment. Um, yeah, I did filter by a cluster. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, they should, filters. Okay. yeah, they should have, I think, a reasonable amount of clusters. Um, okay. Yeah, I, if I had to. Yes, I would say it's probably not an experimental problem, um, yeah, but that looks really I'm good. not positive. <laughs> yeah, that one that one actually looks reasonable. Yeah, I was kind of surprised about. Um, and also, I should I should mention this is um, 
the Boltzmann weighted sum of like 4,000 structures. Um, but I can also just plot the minimum energy of the structure, and it looks the same. So it's the minimum energy for different mutants. The minimum energy for us. When you go to when you make a mutation, mm -hmm. do you then look at all 4,000 structures and make a mutation, and then reestimate the energies of all 4,000 structures? So um, I'm basically starting from the sequence of every mutant and folding that sequence. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm actually. So I, I also did try if I just fold like the native and then I, yeah. I basically thread in. That looks really, really. Good. Oh, I see. Yeah. That does not work. Okay. Um, this this looks like a. This looks, yeah. Okay. This looks pretty promising. Um, but what I was saying is that if you just take the minimum energy structure instead of the Boltzmann bit ensemble of. 4,000 structures, you get something that looks pretty much the same. Um, and then the other thing that we can do is use the nearest neighbor parameter. So I mentioned we already have this really great predictive model that predicts uh, folding free energies of RNA. And so if we use the nearest neighbor parameters to predict the free energy, we get something that also looks quite reasonable, has a, little, a slightly better R value, and sort of cleans up these outliers a little bit. Uh, so. I might say this plot looks a little bit better. And then the other thing that we could do is instead of using the nearest for free energy, just use the energy for the secondary st structure state and um, correct for the probability of that secondary structure formation. And so I should mention in both of these last two plots, I fit a weight on the um, for this. So because we're converting from Kickhouse per mole to Rosetta units, uh, we don't exactly know what the scaling factor is there. And um, when I fit the weight for the secondary structure probability correction term and I force it to be positive, it goes to zero. So um, that, there's no justification, physical justification for that term, right? I think there is a thermodynamic scheme that you can write out that there where is. that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we can talk about that. I think we can talk about it. But I'm, yeah. yeah, I think there is a physical justification for why you would have that. You may need to calculate your complex energy slightly differently, or your, um, yeah, you may need to calculate a few things slightly differently, but I think there is a physical justification. When you scale the nearest neighbor free energy, the mm -hmm. scaling is an attempt to match the optimized R squared or the R D to the experimental delta delta G. Optimize the R squared, yeah. yeah. I feel like you should optimize that. Uh, RMSD. RMSD. And then you would hope that that scale factor would come up to one because the nearest neighbor rules are in KL's mold. Like they're in reasonable units. Right. Right. And then the Rosetta free energies are in reasonable units. So uh, you would want the, put, the scale factor you'd want would be on the Rosetta term. Sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's the same thing, right? You can it's scale the same either thing, one. And all the units are going to come out into reasonable units. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you'll get the same R value at the end. You'll get the same <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the scaling factor is like 2.5 right now. Okay. So that's not one. But yeah, but that's that's for the uh, nearest neighbor. Mm -hmm. That's what you expect, right? Because the range of the values in the Rosetta units is like 2.5 times the range of the units of the experiments, yeah. right? It goes from 0 to 4 kcal to mole yeah. on the x axis and 0 to 10 on the y axis. Yeah. See, so I think if you did what I was saying, you're going to end up with a scale factor for the nearest neighbor rules one, which is which is awesome. Sure, but then you would end up with a scale factor for the Rosetta units of one divided by two point five. That's fine. Right. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Great. It's not quite the same thing because here you're letting the nearest neighbor rules flow relative to delta G prime, and you're optimizing R squared. Yeah. So you're not imposing. A constraint of any sort that the nearest neighbor rules are the same units, kick outs per mole, like physical units, yeah, as the uh, yeah. two binding conditions. Okay, sure. So you could Slightly. come up with something that's off. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good point. I'll recalculate it that way. Okay, so um, that's super impressive. Yeah, yeah, so this is pretty much our current best method. Of Prediction. And so I'll just sort of walk through. I wonder if there's a, let's like, go back. Uh, mm -hmm. those, there's that cluster of outliers. You're probably about to point to it. But um, in the 
yeah, 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 I yeah, it. by the bar part calculation. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So it suggests that maybe, well, yeah, the ultimate fit would come from something like an average between the bar part calculations and the free energy calculations. Something like where you say yeah. the free energy calculations, if you could estimate its error, I think we could probably do by repeating the calculation with different um, models. So yeah. You went to the far far and you assigned some error of like, you know, 1k health per mole. Yeah. And then you took the weighted average. You have two numbers with errors you can take for weighted average. But, yeah. Uh, so you're basically making two estimates for the for the delta gRNA. Uh, delta gRNA. Uh, and then you weight you average them weighted by one over error squared plus a typical formula. Yeah. And um, uh, I wonder if that would be superior to all of these. It's just two different shots at. So average the nearest neighbor prediction. Yeah. And the yeah. Yeah, and what happens is the nearest neighbor prediction, there's going to be some mutants where it's like every stru structure, secondary structure prediction package will look at the same free energy as well. So it'll be okay, a we'll error, so it'll dominate that term. There are going to be some cases, like I think that cluster, where there's going to be a wide area. And the far will start to get in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. This is like a really cool thing to show the, uh, all the comparisons. Cool. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, so I'll just walk through what, what we have so far for the best, best method of prediction. So we calculate the delta G complex using um, uh, using the Rosetta score of the complex using the best rescaled score function that I showed. And we do fixed backbone minimization and side chain repacking. Um, for the delta G RNA, we have a weight factor times the delta G nearest neighbor, which we just talked about. Maybe we'll move that weight factor up to this complex. Um, and and then for the delta G protein, which I haven't really talked about, um, this is just the Rosetta score of the unbound protein um, after fixed backbone minimization and side chain repacking. Kind of unimportant for the comparisons that we're making right now because it's a constant for all RNA mutants, so it's not going to change our comparison to the experimental binding affinities. Um, and so looking at the um, some predictions. We sort of want to know are we actually capturing the general features of MS2 binding that I pointed out. So um, I mentioned that we need to have a purine at the minus 10 position for tight binding. And so I'm plotting here colored in red all of the mutants that have a pyrimidine at the minus 10 position. So they should experimentally have poor binding affinity. And we predict in, in all cases that they have poor binding affinity. So that, that feature we seem to capture. Um, having a pure, we need to have a pyrimidine at the minus five position, and these seem captured sort of reasonably well. It's possible that we're not capturing that perfectly. Um, then we also need to have a purine at, or so we actually need to have an adenine at the minus four position. But here I'm just plotting if we mutate that to a pyrimidine. So the red is the pyrimidine mutations, and we, we seem to predict they all. Don't they bind the before the minus position. Okay. <laughs> so uh, at the seventh position, we have um, so we need to have an in there as well. Here I'm just plotting uh, if we mutate that to a perimeter. And it seems that here we're going to outliers. So if we mutate this adenine at the minus four position to a G, that's pretty much these set of outliers right here. So we don't do a good job predicting those. Um, okay, what happens? Those are predicted to be uh, our those, predictions are like those are good binders, but they're bad binders. Yeah. Oh yeah, but that produces a GRA or G X X A. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 You basically boosted the loop. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Eternal That's players will know this, actually. Okay, cool. Yeah, they yeah. can fix my outliers. They will fix those. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then also if you have a G at this minus seven position, yeah. you get you boosted the tetra loop. These set of outliers. Exactly. Yeah. So we and have a more stable tetra loop, and this is not supposed to capture that and then not capture it. Okay. Yeah. They're, That's great. This model is basically not capturing that. But um 
yeah, actually, if we could get rid of those outliers, it's pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, so there's like the set of outliers. This I'm coloring um, if either is um, mutated to a G. And that's basically this little set of outliers that we have over here. Everything else sort of is within some noise of our measure. Um, so we'll work on this. Um, but sort of back to our project overview, we've pretty much just been working on this first step. And I, I want to come back to the point that Riju was making earlier. We are not really claiming anything rigorous about these calculations. We, um, we're just in the optimization stages for the binding affinity calculation and the score function. And eventually what we want to do is make blind predictions for other systems or for other RNAs binding briefly about what the next steps are going to be. So that would be to expand the set of sequences for, for that we're making predictions for. So I'm just using sequences to change our size canonical base pairs, and they don't have any GU pairs. So we want to expand that set to be able to incorporate these set of sequences. And um, we also want to be able to estimate the errors in our predictions. So when we make a prediction, it's it's a lot more useful if you have error that you uncertainty that you can associate with it. Um, in addition, there's sort of a question within Rosetta. There's a lot of solvation models floating around, and some of these may be better or worse for RNA protein interactions. And so we would like to compare these solvation models. Um, this is GeomSol fast. And okay. Like LK and on That's the RNA based solvation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually already tried. FASOL, which was the protein yeah. one, yeah. It, it does look worse. Okay. So yeah. there is at least a difference. So I think it will be useful to compare patient models. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'd like to be able to explain some of the outliers. We have an idea of where it's coming from, but we'd like to be able to incorporate this into our model so that we don't see those outliers when we make predictions. Um, and then, of course, we want to make blind predictions for another system. And we also sort of have the potential for maybe being able to predict MS2 protein mutations that would alter its specificity. Um, and so that's sort of the next stuff that I'll be working on. And with that, I'd like to thank Riju, of course, for letting me work on this project and for all the helpful discussions that I've had with him. It's been a really fun project to work on as well as other, all the other DOS Lab members. They've been really great. Um, and funding sources, of course. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions.
she doesn't share her screen. Oh, wait. I told me that. Oh. I see her face. <laughs> oh, I think it's like frozen. Oh, we can edit this part out. <laughs> or probably just we'll stop it at the, that part. Uh, really okay. Now I see your presentation. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I don't remember what I was saying. Uh, other questions from us? Well, I, I was curious, and maybe it's, you already explained it, but in the original paper, they could so disentangle what was secondary structure contributions versus primary structure contributions to the actual finding affinity. Mm -hmm. so I was wondering if the data you selected here so samples any of those hairpins that are weak at the very end, sort of frayed, which they thought was contributing to the lower or worse finding. Yeah, so I, I don't think any of the ones that I'm looking at right now are those sequences. Um, but yeah, definitely. I will incorporate in the, in the future. Yeah, hopefully our delta G RNA term would potentially capture that. Yeah. yeah. But know that there's something kind of cartoon about um, framework. So, you know, the the way that the delta G RNA enters is as it's with the minus sign. So if you make a mutation that stabilizes the hairpin, hairpin's mm -hmm. secondary structure, it actually will enter as a penalty. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And if you make mutations yeah. that destabilize the secondary structure, it will enter as a bonus. So there's this interesting subtlety where uh, uh, I think, that, I think that, some, that certainly I was thinking about this incorrectly before. Um, or in an incomplete way before uh, that, okay, you make a mutation, it'll like introduce a UU mismatch. Is that good or bad for the um, system? And, uh, uh, or we stabilize the loop somehow. Is that good or bad for the system? And the answer is it's not obvious. You can go in one direction for delta G and then in the other direction for the protein RNA binding. And I think that when you write your paper, it's worth like explaining that. Yeah. Uh, detail, uh, in some detail, like in two sentences. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I also think that some of the discussion <laughs> in the original paper, um, it will shed a light on those trained train based errors as well. Um, I don't think that the interpretation in the original paper was complete. How do you think you're going to do the redesign of the um, binding cluster scheme? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm actually, I'm not totally sure. I'm not totally convinced yet that it's going to be possible. Um, yeah, I mean, you could imagine if you, if you come up with an RNA sequence that you would prefer it to bind to, you could just basically predict the structure of the current wild type protein with that mutant and then alter the side chains of the protein and try to optimize, try to get better affinity for that. Yeah. Um, but really, you would need to like make these sets of big, big predictions for for the many different mutants to see if you're actually yeah. getting things that are specific. Uh, okay, just to redesign the RNA protein complex and just redesign the protein side chains that are contacting the RNA. Yeah, and redesign the RNA and just see what you get as a lowest energy solution. Yeah, Rosetta. Mm -hmm. Um, and that'll suggest the mutations to make on the protein side. That really is like, hey, if you change this tyrosine to a phenylalanine, you change this RNA U to a G, then you get also Rosetta energy. Yeah. Then you go up to that unit. And then you characterize this full binding landscape, the affinity landscape, and you say, okay, now this is a distinct landscape. Yeah. And that's easy for you yeah. to do. You know how to do it. All you have to do in Rosetta is you change your yeah. packing to a design. It's like one, yeah. one line change. Yeah. It'll be a longer calculation. 
Do that one task. Mm -hmm. we, so can you, can you do both the RNA and the protein? Yeah, you can read that at the same time. Yeah, um, yeah, you should be able to do that. Yeah, it's a long calculation, but you can do it. You can set it up and run it for three hours on your laptop. And go yeah, it's cool, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing you could imagine doing is um, essentially this nearest neighbor will be like a new core energy for the RNA. You mm -hmm. can include it in the equation, like the fact that. Yeah. A great thing about you prediction instead of using fragment assembly and yeah. having to fold 4,000 structures. I mean, I haven't done any sort of tests if you can get away with like way less computation than that. But it's something that you can calculate like instantly. That's not going to slow down your calculation. Yeah, so you can link much. in Vienna fold as a library to Rosetta. Yeah. And there's now a framework in Rosetta where normally design calculations assume a pairwise energy function. Mm -hmm. But there's now a new framework that, uh, a new hook that um, uh, the Baker lab put in where you can put where you can at the end of when you make a mutation the way the packer works is it or the designer works is it makes a mutation recalculates all the energies and to make that fast it looks at it it just it, it, it caches the pairwise energies between every residue and every other residue mm -hmm. but the point is if you have something that um, can is very fast that's not pairwise that can um, rely on the mutations like uh, like, suppose you don't want to have more than five phenylalanine secondary interface. Yeah. So that's so fast to compute, right? Mm -hmm. So there's now a little blurb at the end of the packer or designer that then can apply that constraint for an energy function that is non pairwise but is fast to compute. Okay. So yeah. you would put in yeah. the, uh, the energy calculation, which is also really fast. It's probably like milliseconds. Yeah, probably. And yeah. so you could really you know, do it every cycle of the design calculation. Yeah. And um, like that would rock. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess that would make everything built into Rosetta too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really cool. And I think that Vienna's license. Not sure. I'm pretty yeah. sure it does. Yeah. Okay. Um, if it's for non-commercial use. Yeah. Okay. Cool. The Matthews program, the RNA structure program, I think also has that. Okay. Sure. I mean, that license it allows you to put it wherever you want. That okay. kind of their program. Uh, and maybe even doesn't have to be non commercial. So, you know, like you could just build in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting stuff. So, I guess one, one question from, from my end is do you, have you already started planning the new experiments you might make with the mutants or like? How, how you like, do you have plans or does it all depend on how the progress Yeah, so develops? ideally we want to make predictions for another system with that's sort of a similar sort of system that has like maybe a hairpin binding to a protein. That's sort of the ideal next system. We're sort of thinking about that currently. What, we would want to what are systems you're thinking about? Um, of course, the VTS one that you mentioned. Um, besides that, I need to think about it more. I'm sort of, yeah, focused first on making sure that this is not just completely an artifact that we get any correlation at all. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Pearl says, I may have missed this, but is this to be able to determine if the protein we are binding with has any mutations, whether it will work correctly. Um, so eventually, yeah, you, you could use this to uh, make mutations to the protein and or to um, make predictions for if there were mutations to the protein, how this would alter the specificity pro profile. Um, yeah, you could definitely use this to do do you think you could capture like a short or increase in and lows? Yeah, that there would the exact loop framework would not handle that. But for me, I don't think it would be so capture that. I think 
you might go through the MS to, you know, of that other kind of, uh, should have 40 by sites to the code version. It's been figured out. But, but if you look at it, any that look like this or have like three nucleotide loops instead of tetra loops, mm -hmm. and so they're thought to perhaps be some of the others binding sites to the code protein. Mm -hmm. So three nucleotides, that's the question. Yeah. 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 You can make predictions for those. And my guess is that you will be able to make really good predictions for those. Um, you might be able to do it up to like an offset. Uh, there is a, there is a kind of magic. There's a, there's a term that enters. I know this because I wrote the RNA energy function. Mm -hmm. There's a term that enters that's proportional to the number of nucleotides. It's the ref term. Right. And so if that happens to be off for a nucleotide, I think that that may just like it. all the three nucleotide ones might be unaligned but off by half a kcal or minus one kcal or something. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Or if you add like five nucleotides, and then your I guess your modeling would have to selectively delete one, new, like go to the starter structure and then decide which one to delete. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other options for predictions are the there's another there are other viral hairpin co protein interactions. Yeah. Them. They are kind of like MS2 but not MS2. Mm -hmm. The Q beta phage has a three nucleotide hairpin, but it also has its bulge A. Yeah. PP7 has a five. Nucleotide. Six nucleotide loop. I'm looking it up now. Oh, cool. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> but we'd have to make the protein, the co protein fluorescent, and then we can make us. Yeah. Those might be more baby steps away from before going to the total system. Yeah. Uh, another famous one is the U1A system. That's not a, a human um, splicing yeah. protein. It's part of the. Um, and uh, that's a, also kind of a hairpin. That binds a, a protein. Okay. Yeah. It's of wide interest, and a lot of people have the plasmids to make the protein because it's, everyone uses U1A for okay. crystallization and other stuff. Okay. Uh, in addition to BTS1, there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, those are cool. Do you think this framework will work for the pus? Or does a single strand <laughs> RNA bind? Yeah, uh, it's it's hard to say. I mean. My feeling is it will probably do worse, but may still work sort of reasonably well um, because it's still like um, the delta G RNA. You could still sort of calculate yeah. it in the same way, right? You, yeah. So. You, it's just the secondary structure that that you need to form is no secondary structure, right? Yeah. Um, which is sort of the same thing. Yeah, but it doesn't um, matter because it doesn't. You don't even care about the final secondary structure. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you know, that doesn't enter anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think. It yeah, I think there. So, there may be more conformational entropy in the puff complexes. In the, in the complex. Yeah. And we're not taking that into account at all. Taking single static structure issue. That would probably be my main concern with it. Um, but I'm not sure how much of an effect that would be. Okay, thank you all for listening.